So this How to Blow Up a Pipeline movie is really good, turns out. I was I was quite taken with it. It's lean, it's tense, it's satisfying. For those who don't know, this movie's about a group of climate activists, get this, trying to blow up a pipeline. It shares its title with Andreas Malm's manifesto, but it's an entirely fictionalized dramatization, drawing from the varying schools of thought Malm investigates in the book, which Bear in mind, I haven't read. It weaves in character backstory from our ensemble cast, but for the most part, it's a nuts and bolts play-by-play -play of their two-day process performing this operation. Some of the clear influences, which director Daniel Goldhaber has been quick to own up to, are Soderbergh's Ocean's Eleven, Miss Safdie's Good Time, and Brisson's A Man Escaped. I think A Man Escaped is probably the influence most apt for the subject matter, taking an expository work and fictionalizing it through a still clinical, didactic, almost instructional lens. The word almost will become very important here. But for the Brissonian minimalism it clearly operates in, there's an accessibility to the movie's presentation that feels almost antithetical to anything Brisson was getting at with his Prison Break movie. This is the safety of it all. A trap synth score over tight handheld close-ups that make no stranger of fluorescent lights processed through film emulsion, a ramping tension that follows a linear trajectory rather than a series of ebbs and flows, and a rolodex of relatively unfamiliar faces that bring a raw immediacy to the work. This all works in service of casting a wide net for any theatergoer to buy into the movie as a gripping heist, which is kind of essential as a Trojan horse given its goal of inciting a sense of anti-capitalist vigor in the audience. Whether the movie actually performs this function or gives into pure entertainment has been a subject of contention surrounding its release. But before I get into that, I just want to talk about all the ways this movie is able to have its cake and eat it because it is full of contradictions. The first example is what I was just talking about, its ability to bridge the gap between an ever-stimulating Gen Z nail-biter and the kind of movie that that same demographic would decry on TikTok. And perhaps this combination of styles is the equivalent of throwing Subway Surfer gameplay next to a spark plug tutorial. But I think what it really comes down to is that, despite the pop sensibilities at play, Goldhaber still emphasizes the procedural the micro-moments that convince us we understand how the process works, and how those moments build an ethos that renders the tiniest hand jitters a device of enormous suspense, regardless of style. I'd call this practice the aesthetics of didacticism, taking the brass tacks, if you will, data, educational material, and mining purely aesthetic beauty out of these things. Behind me right now, which has been my backdrop for the past few months, is a geologic map of the US that I've had for years. I don't know anything about rocks. I I can't decipher this thing. But it has a geometric sense of harmony and balance that compels me. A representation of the country's topography, a landscape, if you will, that operates entirely in its own system of logic and lets that dictate composition and design. I think how to blow up a pipeline similarly uses the impression of didactic material to build suspense and dictate its pacing, even if it doesn't actually teach us how these chemicals work. I mean, this is the kind of shit Breaking Bad was doing, and it was awesome there, and it's awesome here. It's also made Maybe the film's Achilles heel. If I wanted to, I could learn about geology and teach myself how to read this map. You're not really able to do that with the process of making a bomb, or even really recruiting members to pull off such an operation based on the movie alone which I'll address more in depth later. The second example of this movie having its cake and eating it is the carefully considered implementation of its flashbacks, which I knew were in the movie beforehand and went in worried about how this would disrupt the flow. On paper, it's a little cheeky cutting away from the present whenever something suspenseful happens, but it's kind of a tried and true method of keeping us invested. And each moment we cut away from is revealed when we return to have some purpose beyond, oh, we had you there for a second. Anyway, back to your regularly scheduled program. Be it establishing the stakes of minute disruptions or genuinely becoming obstacles in the operation. So we carry that suspense through the flashbacks, and then it still escalates when we return, maintaining that unrelenting linear tension. And the flashbacks themselves aren't just opportunities to stall for the sake of suspense or introduce characters. The real currency of these scenes is the conversations debating the various factors that went into the collective decision that blowing up the pipeline was necessary. From the inert efforts of protest groups to the ethics of collateral damage. Each flashback segment has some conversation indicting less disruptive forms of protest, which is the closest the film comes to directly adapting the source material, in the traditional sense of the word. And rather than try to isolate a single moment that radicalized each individual, which would be oversimplistic, these scenes purely serve the plot function of showing us how each member was recruited by Sochi and Sean 
which is the Ocean's Eleven of it all. This is how the flashbacks are able to maintain the film's focus, despite being deviations from the tight narrative we're watching in the present day. You could argue we see Sochi get radicalized, and as the ringleader, she's kind of structurally pointed to as the main character here, but the ensemble's balanced enough to render distinctions like that meaningless here. One thing I've seen the film catch some flack for, which I think is a little silly, is that things are too smooth, and I guess this is a good time to put up a spoiler warning. So for one, I don't even think this is true. Things ultimately go as planned, but there are obstacles along the way. Workers come to the power station just before they're supposed to trigger the oil, the barrel falls and crushes Alicia's leg, Logan gets shot in the arm, so she has to reseal the cabin bomb. These are pretty small obstacles, sure, but because the film puts so much emphasis on the micro anyway, small moments that are one jitter away from blowing up, fingerprints that could compromise the whole situation, these things are sufficient in providing dramatic threat to the situation. And with a slow burn movie like this, anything bigger would naturally have to reset, and then that would disrupt the sense of constantly rising tension, and ruin the lean escalation we wind up with anyway. There's a synergy there between the literal function of how delicately the bomb material is handled, like diegetically in the story, and how delicately the plot functions are handled to keep the film tightly paced. So if not that, is it that the heist went off without a hitch? That the only really big threat, the FBI informant, turns out to be a ruse that the operation was banking on? Because if so, that's exactly what Ocean's Eleven did. And it rocks. And I think this movie has a little more responsibility than Ocean's Eleven, to more or less show them getting away with it. Because when you delve into the waters of making a film as a call to action, you're naturally faced with more moralistic scrutiny. And if you punish the characters for trying to pull this thing off, you're discouraging your audience from the idea that such activism is even possible. And the biggest thing, which is related, is that the movie in no way paints this as an easy feat, constantly throwing around death statistics, again, showing the volatility of the material they're working with, several acts of sheer luck, and the fact that the operation going perfectly still involves at least one person getting arrested probably for life. And the only reason the other person doesn't get life is because she fucking dies from leukemia. They reduce the damage an insane amount, as much as humanly possible, and most of them walk away untouched or even profiting from the ruse, but the movie asserts that there's no real activism without consequence. So with that, I might as well weigh in on whether this movie is itself performing activism, or if it's as virtue signaling as the movie in the movie. Most of the conversation here, I think, boils down to, if you're living in a capitalist system, you can only spread the word through the means possible within capitalism. I mean, Boots Riley just did a show for Amazon. It's fucked up, but it's not gonna stop me from dropping an ad spot here to help pay my rent. It's springtime, and you know what that means. The air is warming up, the flowers are blooming, and the factor boxes are shipping. If you're like me, and did so much spring cleaning that your fridge is now empty, it can be hard to restock on fresh food items, and you just spent so much time on the cleaning, who has time to run to the store now? Well, let me tell you, the buck stops at America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit, Factor. With chef-prepared, dietitian approved meals such as the spicy poblano beef bowl, the creamy pesto pork chop, or the seasonally appropriate tomato goat cheese cavatelli primavera. That buck isn't going anywhere. And for just two and a half minutes of precious microwave time, a factor meal isn't a blip on your rigorous daily schedule. And that's to say nothing of the smaller items to snack on throughout the day, such as their three variants of smoothie. So if it needs saying, head to factor75.com or click the link below and use code TaylorJWilliams50 to get 50% off your first factor box. And sure, there is incredible irony in just how many ties to oil money this movie has in its production and distribution. But maybe that's an indicator of just how pervasive the issue they're trying to fight is, even within their own industry. And if this movie can ironically be a product of that and get people angry at its distributors, is that such a bad thing? If it's actively making the distributors money, then... I guess, yeah. But there's not really a metric for comparing level of activism and praxis inspired by product to profits that earned big oil. The bigger issue A.E. Hunt proposes in his essay on the subject is that even if the sway this movie has in getting people active eclipses the profits it earns these corporations, 
What is it actually teaching people to do? Goldhaber notably sought guidance from the US Bureau of Counterterrorism to ensure that the movie didn't teach you how to make a bomb. And while I think it's probably a good thing to make it not easily accessible in the movie for people with worse intentions than eco-activism, Hunt points out that there's no trail of breadcrumbs or semblance of educational material for people who do want to join the cause to be gleaned here. Which. I would agree it probably should have. But I'm reminded of the Picasso quote that art is a lie that makes us realize truth. Giving the impression of an instructional without actually teaching us to make a bomb at least serves the purpose of getting people to realize the need for such an act incites a revelation, which is what I think actually makes this a faithful adaptation of the manifesto. And that's an emphasis on think, since I'll remind you I haven't read it. But from what I understand, both works use the tools of their respective medium to make a case for blowing up a pipeline, neither actually teaching you how to do it. The book's tools are verbal argument and assessment, which the movie borrows from, but its primary tools are the dramatic devices that make a captivating experience people want to go to and take in. I don't mean to limit the potential of film as a medium into this entertainment box, and Hunt even brings up the history of third cinema, but I don't think it's a function that should be written off entirely. It's a mode of delivery and engagement for people who otherwise wouldn't watch this movie. It's like throwing subway surfer gameplay next to a newsreel. And for the people already in agreement with the movie, they get an exciting thriller out of it without a sense of preaching to the choir. For what it's worth, it's a pretty exciting game of subway surfer. You could argue that these modes are incompatible that the very act of drawing suspense out of a political exhortation, or using revolutionary fervor for the aesthetic purpose of a good time at the movies, is unethical. Or you could argue that instilling a superficial sense of radicalism into audiences who will then do nothing and return to their normal lives is actively hindering the potential to get people involved because they'll feel satisfied in their complacency. But at a certain point, you have to just let the audience do what they will with the material, because the movie isn't exactly subtle about anything it's saying. And look, I think this may very well not be any form of activism, and Goldhaber's even conceded to its primarily entertainment-focused aspirations. I don't think it really matters. Time will tell the influence of this movie, and if nothing comes out of it, and all it ever amounted to was an expertly crafted heist movie that also brings up compelling points about the need for environmental action, I think there are worse things to be. That's it from me. Agree or disagree. Whatever it is, make sure you comment it while you're liking and sharing and subscribing and pledging money to my Patreon and watching the latest Happy Hour, where I talk ad nauseum about all the movies I watched over the course of the past month. Thanks for watching, catch you in the next one, and goodbye.